gentlemen, kindly settle down. We're about a minute away from beginning. Thank you. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure you all enjoyed the industry breakout sessions, and I hope you've seen the World Solutions Zone as well. Once again, welcome to this very, very interesting part of the evening. I'd like to tell you what's happening now today. We have someone very, very special with us, and it gives me immense pleasure to be able to introduce this amazing gentleman to each and every one of you. He is a mechanical engineer by education. He has been working in the field of education reform for more than 27 years. In 1998, just after he finished his engineering, he founded SECMOL, which is Students, Education, and Cultural Movement of Ladakh, which aims at bringing reforms in the government school system in Ladakh. In 1994, he was instrumental in launching Operation New Hope, a triangular collaboration of the government, village communities, and civil society to bring reforms in the government school system. And today, he's here with us. But before I call him up on stage, we have a short video that will kind of sum up his whole life for you. So please take a look, ladies and gentlemen. I want every single one of you in the audience to give this man a huge round of applause as I invite him on stage. Please put your hands together for the living legend, Mr. Sonam Wangchuk, as he comes on the stage. I want a bigger round of applause, everyone. This man truly deserves every bit of appreciation. Thank you so much, sir, for taking the time out. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the warmth that you have shown, and warmth I mean in every sense of the word, because I have flown from Ladakh, where it was minus 15 in the morning, so I thoroughly enjoy the warmth of all of you and the, the place uh, Goa. Um, it was very cloudy, almost snowing, and the sky opened and this plane landed, and we were hurriedly pushed into the plane because they thought the other planes would be cancelled, so I don't know whether others operated, but I'm here uh, after some five, six hours. And very happy to be here with the Cisco, who we have known for some years. I've been to your company in Bangalore, and a team from your company has helped us at our school to establish an intranet um, network. So great to be with friends again and uh, all of you from different companies. Uh, we share something common in very different worlds. While you use technology, digital kind of technology, and believe in innovation in different ways, we up in the mountains use technologies of a different kind that are very simple, yet very effective in improving uh, lives of people and solving people's pro problems, and I have been engaging young people in solving such problems using simple science uh, to make life better in the mountains. So both are very important. While digital is important, plain principles of science uh, cannot be forgotten, while artificial 
intelligence is important, some natural intelligence is also very important. So <clears throat> I'll share with you today uh, how technology of different kinds can help change lives. Um, I share with you my story from Ladakh about using technologies of different kinds that are basically high school science, but when applied, they can mean a lot. Uh, technology for the sake of technology doesn't impress me. For me, technology uh, at its best is when it is very simple but effective, when it can solve problems and create value almost out of thin air. So I'll take you through my journey in the mountains of Ladakh, a very different world from, uh, I'm sure, most of the bases that you have come from. And therefore, I think my story could better be explained by images than my 1,000 words, as they say. So I'll take you through some pictures of the place with the story interwoven. So yes, this is uh, Ladakh, where I came from this morning and where I was born and brought up. Top north of our country, across the Himalayas, actually, in the rain shadow of the Himalayas. Himalayas are very green because of the rains that fall from the clouds like monsoon, but when they strike the Himalayas, they shed their humidity or uh, water there, and very little goes across the Himalayas where we live. And therefore, we are said to be in the rain shadow of the Himalayas. So, it's a landscape, or rather moonscape, or marscape like this. And when you approach by air, you may think life wouldn't even be possible here. But if you look a bit carefully, then you see the green patches, the oasis that humans have added to this rugged mountain desert, where precipitation is almost non-existent. 100 millimeters, four inches in a year. And yet people mastered life in these conditions by channelizing melting glaciers and cutting rocks to make canals that would take the water to any patches of desert and turn them green. So innovative our parents, our ancestors have always been. And thanks to that, life was possible there. And they have used throughout the ages different technologies using gravity to take water on desert patches, using water to run their water mills, or even prayer wheels, and so on. If you go closer, then you see a Ladakhi little village where one could say human beings, for a change, have enriched nature because there is no F, uh, deforestation possible in these deserts. So whatever green you see, Whatever afforestation you see is all human contribution. Despite being very harsh looking, people have not only survived, but a whole colorful civilization has thrived, full of innovative uh, ingenuity of a different kind. For example, in these mountains, how they farm is not easy. And the cold is bitter in winters. And yet, people have found their own very creative ways. So every act of farming, which is a drudgery up in the mountains, is accompanied by music, singing, or even whistling, so that the work becomes a song or a dance. And the whole community comes together to each family, and they finish the work with a lot of fun, even if it is hard work, it becomes a lot of fun. I can say much more fun than a lonely California 
combine harvester driver in his cabin. <laughs> so technology can be very different. They can come in the shape of innovative music and dance that goes with the rhythm of work, or they can come with high altitude uh, farming where glacial melt waters are channelized. Or how they dealt with the cold winters was also interesting. Winters are very cold and long, but our ancestors used their imagination by putting all the festivals of every village and monasteries in the winter months. So young people passed the winter counting festival to festival, and then without, you know, all the heating gadgets and uh, HVAC, you actually can handle winters better with just music, dance, folk stories, and so on. Anyway, uh, we'll go further to what uh, we are doing these days or in modern times. So life here was very different in the olden times, but when we started opening to the world, we realized we were a tiny microscopic minority. So when Ladakh became a part of the vast Indian uh, subcontinent, we were rendered like a microscopic minority, not only linguistic and ethnic, but climatic and technological as well. So in a cold mountain region, simple things like running a tap becomes quite a circus. Pipes freeze, they burst, and people have to do all kinds of uh, circuses to keep it running. Not because it's difficult or the technology isn't there, but mainly because it's just copied and pasted from tropical plains to the mountains. And of course, they don't work in minus 20 or 30, what perhaps works in Delhi or Mumbai. But half the time, they don't even work in Delhi. So less chances they'll work in a place like Ladakh. So therefore, we believe that each region has to innovate to solve their own problems and engage young people in the process through education. <clears throat> That's how education should be. Now, in Ladakh, being a minority hurts in technological and climatic ways, but it hurts most little children who study in schools and have textbooks that make no sense whatsoever to the mountains that makes some sense to the plains or the cities, but in the mountains, it makes no sense. So when I was growing up uh, and in my late teens, I came across this situation in Ladakh. The school system didn't care who the textbooks were meant for. They were just transported, teleported, or trans, uh, you know, planted in the mountains, and uh, children failed en masse. Very soon I saw that actually the children were not at fault. They had to study textbooks, for example, that made them memorize A for apple, B for ball. OK, makes sense. A is abstract, so apple children can relate to. B is just a squiggle. Ball, they can relate to. Good idea. But then when it is cut and paste, it becomes in a minus 30 winter, children are memorizing F for fan, F for fan. A fan doesn't make any squiggles simpler for the children. And the children can't even turn to the teacher. If they ask the teacher, sir, what is this fan? Teacher might say, you don't know what a fan is. No, sir. Actually, I also don't know. <laughs> I've never seen such a contraption. Why would I? You know, when the whole issue is about heating up, why would you? And you, you explain to the children that I found out this is a contraption to keep you cool. The children will completely lose it, you know. Why would you want to keep yourself cool or cooler than it already is? 
So that explains just a simple example of why children were failing in such large numbers. 95% would fail in the 10th grade every year, year after year. And they were blamed. The children were blamed, actually, not the system. Teachers who generally came from across the mountains, the Kashmir or Jammu, didn't understand the language nor the context and didn't understand why the children didn't understand. So they would just brand the children as, you know, mediocre or uh, retarded even. And I have heard teachers sometimes inventing their own pseudoscience and saying, these kids can never do well in maths and science. There's not enough oxygen in the air. Now, kids know they cannot fabricate oxygen, so they might as well give up. So the little they would do would even stop. That's the last thing a teacher could do. So that's how the situation was. And I was lucky to come face to face with this situation because of an accident in my own life whereby I had to support my engineering education myself. So I had to raise uh, the funds to support my engineering and I chose to teach students in 10th grade level. And when I started teaching, I could see how bright they were, how so passionate, keen, enthusiastic, and yet they would fail. I could see that there was nothing wrong with the students. There was everything wrong with the system. And therefore, I decided this incident changed my life. And I decided, rather than adding another engineer to the long queues uh, outside employment bureaus, I would rather help liberate all these bright minds shackled by this system. So I then onward started working on changing the education system after finishing my own engineering. So I finished my engineering, thoroughly enjoyed, but half my mind was uh, in the education system. As soon as I got out of the engineering system, I put it on the sort of back, back burner for some time and started working to change this system. And uh, to do that, we wanted to change the system in the government schools because that's where the students uh, would, you know, study most of the students. And the 95% failure, we initially started helping them pass better and they did pass better after our coaching and help and so on. But very soon we said, if we keep repairing broken products, kind of band-aid solution, the system will keep producing broken products for decades and we would only be repairing them at the last year. So we better look at the source and correct it there so that they don't fail in the first place and we don't have to be doing this charity of helping. So they don't need help in the first place. And therefore, we started going to the villages to change the system in the schools, in the rural schools at the grassroots. And to do this, we had the help of the students who were failing, who were victims of the system themselves, who were large in number, as I said. 95% would fail and feel depressed. Instead, they got a purpose to go into villages and mobilize the people to demand quality education. You know, in a democracy, governments change policies only when people demand such policies. You know? That's why democracy um, reflects the people, or they say people get the leaders that they deserve. If, they, if the people only ask for subsidies, kerosene, and rice, leaders are happy giving them. It's so easy for them. But if you somehow change the programming of the people to want quality education as a 
long-term solution to all their problems, then governments start changing more serious issues like the education system. So we go into villages everywhere, sometimes, you know, one week of trekking and so on. These kids would go to mobilize the people to ask for education. And when political leaders would see that nowhere they're asking for kerosene or rice anymore, education is the buzzword, they had to change the system. So that's how the government system was changed by people demanding change, but people's ch demand was changed by these so-called failures of the system. It was an interesting intervention where helpless students who were branded as failures changed the priorities of the people which finally changed the priorities of the government itself. And that's why in 96, when Ladakh got its own hill council set up, an autonomous set up, elected government, they uh, declared education as their top priority. Hmm? That's what you need, the government taking uh, education seriously. Secondly, we changed all the textbooks. If they are useless, better change them. They are no holy books that have come down from the heavens. They are man-made to help people. If they don't help people, better change them. So we changed the F for fan type books to reflect the local realities and things that a child could relate, train the teachers so they could teach and engage children at a level that children are comfortable, hands-on, engaged, and so on. And with all these uh, measures, soon the results started changing. You can see it used to be 5% consistently. Slowly it changed and went up to 75%. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. And I always celebrate this as a proof of a new scientific discovery that it is not oxygen in the air that, <laughs> that makes a lucky student not perform. <laughs> it's other than oxygen, right? Now you can tell who had problems with oxygen. Those who <laughs> pro uh, propounded such theories. So it went up and up to 75, but we thought 75 is also not a great figure. 25% is a huge number still. Even 1% is big, actually, if that 1% touched you. Otherwise, it's just statistics, figures. So we said, why not parallelly work to help those who were still failing? Who were still failing. We shouldn't give up on them because in a poor system, in an ill-conceived system, those who fail may not be bad ones or unusual ones. Those who perform may be actually unusual ones, you know, if the system itself is unusual. So we started working with those who were different. Now our theory was that in a system where you are caged in a classroom for six to seven hours a day, lectured and made to scribble notes, it's not a system we humans have evolved with. It's a very different thing from how human young ones have learned for millions of years. Human young ones have actually always learned outdoors, engaged, hands-on, in the thick of action, sometimes life-threatening. And that's why nature through evolution pack these young ones with lots of energy to deal with such chances. As hunter-gatherers, our young ones are always in the field learning together with the grown-ups. As settled farmers in the last 10,000 years, they were again out in action. Suddenly, in the last two or three hundred years, we started putting them in classrooms and making them sit and listen and write, stripping them of all the action that their bodies were designed by evolution. And then, of course, this energy comes out in ugly ways called teenager rage, rebellion, and so on. 
So we thought in a system like these, those who failed actually might be more normal, so they couldn't do in an abnormal system. And therefore, we should give them the conditions that they are designed for. So we went to a desert in the middle of nowhere. That's what it was in 94. And together with a batch of such students, so-called failures, we started designing and building a school that was different. After five or six years, this was created on that desert where the students designed uh, and built with adult guidance, of course, but all their energies were channelized into creating and constructing their own school, a school that was totally solar heated, built with natural materials like earth, which is right under our feet, powered by sun right above our head, both are free, abundant, and therefore a solution for every person's need for shelter, energy, and so on. So this was also an experiment in learning for grown-ups as much as for children. This school was also different in that at this school, the admission criteria has never been ranks and grades and marks. It has been that you have to have failed in system to get here, yeah? <laughs> And the students run school also. Teachers are in the back seat. Students are in the driving seat. They run the school themselves, and they run it like a little country, which is what they have prepared themselves for, the real world. So they run it like a little country with a little government and a parliament that lasts for two months. Every two months, there's a new government that comes, when a new government, after an election, takes over, they uh, plan, set goals, and during the two months, they execute those, and finally, they present before a little parliament their work, their learnings, and what needs to be done, and so on, and be prepared for the real world that way. And during the two months, they actually take serious responsibilities in this little country. For example, some would take care of the cows, would give all the milk to the campus. Others would take care of the solar gadgets. Yet others would produce organic green vegetables. But these kids would relate the sciences and other subjects they would study in classrooms and apply them. For example, the ones dealing with the cows would use statistics chapter to track the productivity of the cows and make pie charts and bar charts and so on for each cow and explain to the other. Those who are working on solar gadgets would use physics and the concave mirrors and lenses and light optics and so on. Those growing vegetables, for example, would sell their products to the campus kitchen at a selling price and then also work backwards to find a cost price of every kilo of the vegetable, and thereby practically learn that profit is equal to selling price minus cost price, yeah? And then be ready for real life that way. So power plants and greenhouses would use fresh greens, um, all thanks to the sun, solar power plants and solar greenhouses. Likewise, innovations around the themes that are important in the mountains, like earth, sun, ice, and fire, is what our life and learning revolves. So earth, if we take first, earth is this material with which the whole campus is built without using cement and concrete. Now to do that, we didn't have to go far to learn. We could learn from our ancestors in Ladakh, and sisters have always built with mud or earth, and some of their buildings have lasted five to eight hundred years. So you can imagine 
that they were not poor materials. Concrete, cement, is said to have a life of 60 to 100 years. So, we'd go to these buildings that have lasted longer than others, and therefore we can see, knowing that there must have been something right about them, and that's why they lasted. And if we reverse engineer, we can create new buildings that would last longer. So forts like that, 800 years old, four stories tall, without any shelter, still stands. And we studied the composition of the mud, what the mixes were, and then recreated this school. Similarly, the sun comes into play to give all the energy. This, our ancestors, unfortunately, didn't have. They didn't have glass or transparent materials, uh, first of all. So, of course, they couldn't have. So, we added to our ancestors' knowledge, rather than throwing the baby with the bathwater, we learned and retained and added what modern science teaches us. So, for example, where you see below, it's an application of high school science. The students see their chapter on heat come alive and thereby make that chapter unforgettable. Heat, if you remember your high school science, is about conduction, convection, radiation. But we most of the times memorize the definition, write it in the exam, and that's the end of it. So here they get to see that in the greenhouse, as you see in the picture, and same below, the sun heats the air, which then becomes hot and therefore lighter, and goes through the upper windows into the building, loses its heat to the walls there, and therefore cools down, becomes heavier, and is pushed into the greenhouse again, where the cycle restarts, Heats up, rises, cools down, pushed back. All day there is a convection current in the building that transports the heat of the sun from the greenhouse to the walls of the building. Without any motors, without any technology of that kind, natural technology that runs all the winds that we feel thanks to this convection. So convection comes alive. Similarly, the sun that strikes on the south wall, in the peak of heat around 2 p.m. in the day, conducts through the molecules of the mud on the south and slowly reaches inside the room at 2 a.m. in the night when there is no sun. So that heat comes inside. And both of these, the heated walls and the conduction through the south wall, at night start radiating inwards and making people comfortable. So they get to see conduction, convection, radiation actually change lives. And thanks to this, these buildings stay without any artificial heating at around plus 15 to plus 18, even when it is minus 15 outside. Now that's science helping people and education coming alive. And along the way, the students learn practically that sun in the northern hemisphere stays in the southern sky, as you can see there, and therefore all the buildings need to be oriented towards the uh, southern sky so that it captures all the heat of the sun during the day. So all buildings at this school face south. And this is such a magic direction that in the winter, all the sun comes deep inside your room and heats it up. In the summer, not a ray will come into your room and make your building the coolest of all buildings in summer and warmest of all buildings in winter because, again, they learn that in summer, the sun stays overhead. Finally connected to the fact that the Earth is tilted 23 and a half degrees, but they see practically the effects of that. And therefore, why they don't need to use all this energy. But unfortunately, the engineers of the system often build their houses right facing north, where the cold wind come and no sun, and then shiver the rest of the time in the building. So applying 
even things as small as high school science can be such a big difference if we were to care and use. Similarly, how winds blow, they would learn, and here the winds come from the west. So even before the buildings were built, we started planting trees to break this wind. Every 50 meters, there's a wall of trees that breaks wind so it doesn't cool the residences as much. So learning the environment and applying the knowledge in how you live can change things. Direction towards south doesn't cost more money than direction towards north or anything. Mud doesn't cost more than any material. Sun doesn't cost anything. So these are creating value out of thin air. <clears throat> Anybody can afford it. And therefore, houses like those keep the students warm while they apply cutting edge solar passive science in how to build the school. They also practice age old agricultural techniques where animals plow the field. You would wonder why not tractors because tractors do not contribute manure. Cows give dung, dung becomes manure, manure makes your fields grow, whereas tractors break that whole cycle. So we find perfect harmony in the rhythm of having animals help and their products or waste products fertilize the ground. And what is wrong with technologies of the past that work perfectly without breaking the cycle? And buildings that are built with mud like this are not aesthetically worse. If at all, I find them more modern than modern or postmodern. <clears throat> and they are very natural, non-toxic. There's nothing toxic released from the walls or floors or anything. It's all 100% natural. <clears throat> now, going against the tide, building with mud was seen as something ridiculous when we started in mid-90s. People would laugh at us for going backwards. But we thought there was nothing wrong with the material that was available to everyone. So why would we bother if people laugh at us? Luckily, over the years, the world started catching up. And by 2016, thanks to the environmental crisis, global warming, and so on, the world did really start catching up and we, for the same buildings that we were laughed at, we got the, the renowned uh, Terra Award at the World Earth Congress in 2016 in Lyon. Yeah? <clears throat> this is to say that if you are right in your approach, it doesn't matter if 99 people go the other way. It doesn't make your way wrong and that way right. Similarly, we've been using sun as a source of energy for almost everything, from cooking with parabolic concentrators, to greenhouses to produce fresh greens in winters, to natural lighting, photovoltaic electricity to bridge the gap, <coughs> water heating, water pumping. Even the cows at this campus live in solar-heated cow sheds. Hmm? And we discovered a new science in the process. We built this cow shed out of compassion for the animals. We said, people live in solar warm houses, why not cows? So the students got together and built that solar heated cow shed. And soon we realized that the cows were reciprocating the generosity. They started giving three times more milk than other cows in the area. Can you, can you guess why? Again, it turns out to be simple high school science or even middle school. We didn't realize this was an accidental you know, discovery. We later figured out that cows, like humans, are warm-blooded animals. And we, warm-blooded animals, have to maintain 37 degrees. A degree higher or lower can kill us. So the cows, these huge 300 kg cows, have to, poor things have to maintain at 37 degrees. When the cow shed is minus five, where will they get all the heat to keep their body, you know, 40 degrees above the surroundings? Where? The food. 
that you get to eat is converted into heat, then how can you expect milk? But if you give that warmth from cheaper sources like the sun in a solar heated cow shed, then the food converts into more milk, and therefore they reciprocate. So this was our high school science, you know, a discovery. <clears throat> For these, again, the world started catching up, as they say. We got a global award for sustainable architecture in 2017 in Paris again. Again, we started in mid-90s when, you know, zero energy, off-grid, these terms were not even coined, and people didn't understand when we tried to explain we are going solar, everything from photovoltaics to dishes, cooking, and so on. But if you stand and persist, slowly the world comes and catches up. Now, we are using our experience and attempting to solve an even bigger problem that I might share with you. This is very recent work of the last one or two years. You see this picture, can you recognize what part of the world it is? Hmm? India? No? It is India. It is north of India, and then you see the Himalayas, and up north, across the white mountains, we are in Ladakh. But what I wanted to show you was the clouds. Clouds on the plains of India. You see the clouds? A little shade of cloud. These are very special clouds. These are no normal clouds. They look like end clouds, and this image was taken by satellites of NASA. What they also took was the source of these clouds. They were no normal clouds. You can see thousands of little sources of this smoke. You now guess where it is and what it comes from? Stubble burning, paddy straw burning in Punjab and Haryana at scale that is visible from satellites. All these little fires are causing that uh, smoke and smog that kills Delhi. If you are from Delhi, you know how it gets in October, November. So this fire causes so much pollution locally and globally because of the CO2 and other suspended particles in the plains of India. And then there's another part of the bigger problem is this. On the other side of the Himalayas, you can see the air so polluted because it's so cold in the winters that everybody has furnaces burning in their house, throwing in whatever, wood, paper, plastic, to heat the houses. And that's making the air unbreathable in the Himalayas also. In the plains, in the Himalayas. So what we are doing again is using very simple, ancient technology upgraded to modern needs. Oh, add to that. Add to that across the Himalayas, this is another problem. Fires caused by these heating systems. So, for example, Indian Army has a huge presence in Ladakh, close to the local population. And because they come from warm places, they need a lot of heating and burn a lot of kerosene, wood, coal, whatever they get. And there are many fire accidents. Actually, more soldiers die in fire accidents than enemy fire. So, that's another problem. And to solve these, we are trying to use our experience to build prefabricated passive solar mud houses, yeah? using our experience of the past. But our buildings were built very slow. People like the military want it very fast. And therefore, conventional technique of doing that won't work. So we are working now on prefabricated. So you build the parts of the building in a plant and then assemble it on site in weeks rather than years. Very simple, primordial technology. What we do is take clay from the mountains, very fine clay, 
and take straw. Straw is fiber. When you mix with clay, you get an interesting product that is light in weight, hard, and can handle uh, movement and shipment and so on. Fiber reinforced products, actually, you know. Uh, here we call it straw clay. Doesn't sound as glamorous as fiber reinforced plastic, FRP. Yeah? You know that, that fiber can reinforce. So if we called it fiber reinforced clay, FRC, perhaps it would work better with people. So this is actually fiber reinforced clay that gives the similar, similar kind of uh, qualities to clay, light in weight, portable, movable, and uh, insulating, because it is made with straw and clay, very insulating. So these are parts of the wall that we are prototyping. And then you put it in a house like that, like go. This, there is the serious problem of water in the mountains. You may have heard with climate change, glaciers are melting. Have you heard? Glaciers are melting and they are causing floods often and they are becoming smaller and smaller. So farmers in Ladakh face a huge problem in the springtime. Springtime is a crisis time for farmers in Ladakh. Why springtime? Because springtime is when you plant new seeds, new trees, and all the old trees also wake up from the long winter asking for water. So you have your highest water need in springtime, April, May, early June. But springtime is also the lowest supply of water. So the streams have a trickle because it's not warm enough for glaciers to melt yet, early spring. And they are smaller and smaller now, anyway, to melt. So a trickle comes, which has to be distributed to everybody, causing water conflicts and so on. But come midsummer, and there is not only enough water, there is actually floods. Why? Because in the heat of summer, the glaciers melt very fast, shedding the water at once and the snow melts and everything comes down and you are now in another kind of problem, too much water. And this flow continues into autumn and even winter. Winter because nobody needs water, nobody farms, so the water keeps flowing even in winter and it sadly goes into the Indus River and then in Arabian Sea without being of use to the people. So. Three years ago, together with my students, we started exploring a solution for this. We saw that actually water was not in short supply. It was ill time. There was more water than need at the wrong times of the year. So, for example, in winter, when nobody needs there's a lot of water, can we freeze it 
and keep it till springtime, May, June, and then use it for trees and so on. Of course, you can expect. People laughed. They said, all the snow and ice on the ground goes by March. How can you keep it till May and June? They were right. There is no snow left after March. But we wanted to see if we can. Luckily, one fine day, I saw outside our school, under a bridge, a chunk of ice from winter in the month of May, mid-May. That proved to me that it's not warmth of spring that melts all the ice, because warmth of spring is same under the bridge also. What is different under the bridge is exactly direct sunshine. Direct sunshine is what is different and it has lasted. Therefore, ice melts more because of direct sunshine than the warmth of spring. So if you cut the sun, you can have large quantities of ice into May or even June. Easier said than done, right? How do you cover the ice with a big ditch or what? So we kept thinking, how can we cut the sun? We thought of materials, uh, nets, and so on. Everything was coming prohibitively expensive, of course, to cover large quantities of water or ice. Then we thought, if we only think of materials to cover, there is no solution. Can we have something different? Luckily, to our help came high school science again. This time, it was maths or geometry, to be precise. In geometry, if you remember, we learn, we all learn, but forget, that certain shapes have minimal surface of area for the given volume. Shapes like, if you remember, spheres, hemispheres for more practical reasons, stability, or even cones. Yeah? So we thought, how about using shape rather than materials? Shape don't cost money. So how about having a cone of ice, large enough to hold a lot of water, and that would, in a way, trick the sun, because a cone would have minimal surface area for the volume. The sun needs surface area to work. And farmers don't care about surface area. They need volume. So that's a good combination. How about cones? So we started with a prototype of making a cone or a pyramid of ice. Now again, pyramids, easier said than done, are not easy to build. Ask the Egyptians, right, if they are easy. But how about using some more simple signs and make the water make itself into a pyramid? So primary or middle school science says that water always maintains its level. If you have an inlet, the outlet, outlet will want to go to the same level. Or there will be pressure in the pipe. This is in a pipe to go to the same level. And if you put a fountain, it would spray the water into the air, into the minus uh, 20 air. So using slopes of mountains like this as our resource, no electricity, no motors, nothing, just the slope, which all mountains have. In other words, gravity. You could put a pipe upstream there and below in the pipe will be pressure for going to the same level. In other words, you can see through this, if you put a pipe upstream, the water inside will build pressure. And if you put a fountain, it will spray, spray into minus 20 air. Now, to that height, water goes as liquid. But after it reaches the cold air, it loses its heat, the heat that keeps it liquid and becomes solid. This heat, if you remember, high school science is called latent heat, right? If you remove the latent heat just by spraying it in the cold air, another resource that you get naturally, you don't pay for that cold resource, it turns into a cone itself, almost like 3D printing of a cone with water as the material.
This cone was seven stories tall, uh, roughly 70 feet, and it stored roughly a million liters of water. And this was our pilot, and all the students, and teachers were betting how long it would last. Some would say, I would be happy if it lasts till end of March, mid May, late May. Wildest was, I think, mid May or something. This lasted till July, yeah? the last bit. <coughs> Thereby proving that our area hypothesis was right and uh, making it work technically is half the innovation. The other half is social, emotional, getting people to accept it, relate to it, own it. So that's why we, rather than calling it an ice cone or ice pyramid, we saw that in the landscape there are other cones that people cherish, and they are called stupas, so we call them ice stupas, to position it and brand it in a way that people can relate to. Ice stupas was our branding strategy, and stupas have the prayer flags, so we even put prayer flags on the first stupa, and we were not lying completely when we told the villagers, if we put the prayer flag, the ice will last longer in the summer not because of any divine forces, but mainly because of partial sun shading and partial wind break that it would cause in warm springs, right? So anyway, this was more to position it as a, as a uh, relatable thing from our tradition. And <clears throat> thanks to that, today there are lots of visitors and pilgrims to these ice stupas, yeah? So here I'll show you how it happened. This is a melting ice stupa. This is in actually late June when it's melting and giving its water. So there you can see in winter, the right half shows in how it is made in winter and the left half shows how it unmakes itself or melts in May and June. It melts and so the water flows into a tank and from there pipes drip irrigate trees, uh, 5,000 of them uh, are growing in a desert they have th where there has been no trees ever. So this is possible by bridging that springtime gap. Mind you, it's not giving all the wet water that the tree needs. It's giving just the springtime gap, the crisis time. After that, the um, glaciers melt and there is excess of water. Same pipe brings the natural water and that takes over very soon. So these are some of the ice stupas of the later years. These ones held roughly three million liters of water. You can see how tall they are. This one was, I think, nine stories tall. And now I have, I think, some very recent ones. This is from one week ago. Now it's spreading to the villages. So the villagers in one valley built an even bigger ice stupa than what we built. This one is 120 feet, half the height of Kutub Minar, yeah? that villages built. And you can see there, that's in this place called Chara. And they're building in all other places within Ladakh and beyond. Even in Switzerland, our uh, students go and work with the Swiss to build ice stupas. Partly for tourism attraction, partly to solve water issues. It's spreading slowly. And right this week, we are seeing the beginnings of a new kind of tourism in Ladakh, a winter tourism of ice cafes inside ice stupas in one village, hmm? ice climbing at another ice stupa. So it's clubbed with tourism so that it is an experience for the visitors and the income becomes uh, finally, you know, supporting the water for the farmers. Hmm? Now, for next year, we are thinking of another addition, and that's converting the ice stupa with its central dome and the tunnel for access into an ice hotel, huh? which will be an added experience for the tourists. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Similarly, 
this technique uh, in 2016 won the Rolex Award for Enterprise. It came with a sizable amount of <coughs> money. So we thought a crore rupees from this award, if we use it, will be finished. But if we make it into a seed for a bigger change, maybe that would be transformative. So we thought solutions like these that you have seen need not be a one-off thing in some corner in the Himalayas or some person somewhere. It should be a part of every young person's education. So how about starting an alternative university which does education this way? Applying the learnings to solve problems and make life better for people where two-thirds of the time students are outdoors doing things and one-third is to learn from experts of present and past. So that's what we started doing. So we strategically used this award. The day this award was announced or given, we launched a crowdfunding campaign to make an alternative university of makers and doers on this desert, where at the top you saw the ice stupas being started. And then we hope slowly to make the whole desert green with a university in the middle. And uh, the day this award was announced, we started a crowdfunding campaign to make it a people's university. Because people contributing little, small, 500s and thousands is also a vote of approval you know, for governments to see. Uh, and therefore, we did it the way in the past stupas were built with shramdan. So this was internet age shramdan. Yeah? People from world over not only contributed their thousand rupees or lakh rupees, but also contributed their expertise. People who had retired offered to teach, and people who were still young offered to volunteer, and so on. So a crowdfunding campaign to start a university uh, which summarizes all our experiences for the past uh, 25, 30 years. This little film captures it and summarizes. I've never let my schooling interfere with my education. So said Mark Twain. How about you? Do you miss your school or college days? You perhaps do, but perhaps not for the classrooms and teachings. You actually perhaps wished every day that the school be closed the next day so you could stay home. But here's a school in Ladakh where the most dreaded punishment is to be sent home for two weeks, where students learn by doing things, where they engage in various innovations to solve real life problems like climate change where they run the school themselves like a little country with an elected government and learn management and governance that way. Where they learn communication by running the campus newspaper and radio. Science by designing and building their own school, solar heated mud buildings that stay at plus 15 even when minus 15 winters. Kindness and compassion through introspection and meditation. A school where the criteria of admission is not your percentage, but that conventional system has failed you. Hi, I'm Sonam Wachuk from Ladakh, a remote mountain region in the Indian Himalayas. 25 years ago, when I was finishing my own engineering education, I saw that schools were a pain for everyone. But for mountain children, it was doubly painful and irrelevant. Children who spoke Ladakhi or Tibetan at home were made to sit all day memorizing in alien languages like Urdu or English. F for fan, S for ship, T for train. Till recently, every year, 95% of the students used to fail in the all important 10th grade exams. Together with like-minded friends, we launched SECMOL, the Students' Educational and Cultural Movement of Ladakh, and said enough is enough. Working with the government, we rewrote many textbooks, retrained teachers, and organized the villagers. And the results started changing too. For those who still failed, we started the alternative school that you just saw. And the results? 
Tewang Rigzin went on to become a top journalist and later became the education minister of Ladakh Hill Council at 27. He had failed his 10th grade five times. Stanzin became a filmmaker and has been winning awards across countries. He had failed four times. Miss Tinless is today a celebrated social entrepreneur. She had failed three times. But now we see that the state of higher education is no better. Not only for Ladakhis, who of course are doubly disadvantaged again, but for you in big cities too. It's time we change this. We in Ladakh are dream again. This time our dream is to create an alternative university that will use all our learnings from the past 25 years. Once again, a hands-on doers university, where the school of business runs real-life companies on campus. The school of tourism runs high-end hotels and simple homestays. The school of education runs innovative schools. The revenues from these sustain the university while the students get free higher education and of course hands-on experience. But this is more than a dream now. His Holiness Ketan Rinpoche, one of the top spiritual leaders in Tibetan Buddhism after His Holiness the Dalai Lama, is supporting this cause as the chief patron. The Hill Council Government of Ladakh has earmarked roughly 200 acres of land and the Aisupa artificial glaciers have already started greening the desert. A fully solar-heated mud-built university township is being planned by some of India's top architects. Together, let's start the next learning revolution. Their education is not limited to just the three R's. All too much to do with the head alone, where skills of the hands and kindness of the heart are given equal importance. Sure, it takes significant financial resources to materialize this ambitious dream. Recently, I was awarded the prestigious Rolex Award for Enterprise for the ice to our artificial glaciers. Sonam Wanshuk. I contribute my Rolex Award as a seed for this cause. Thank you very much. I have decided to contribute the roughly one crore rupees as a seed fund to finally raise 150 crore rupees for the first phase of the project. And I very much hope that you all will join me and match this contribution according to your capacities. Together, we can change the face of higher education forever, not just for Ladakh, but for the whole world. So join us. The future has already begun. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And an update, I'll share that this uh, spring, we are starting already with the first batch of a fellowship at this university. And after the Rolex award of one crore, I've been able to personally also, from talks like these, contribute a crore rupees every year. And uh, this is not the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much for taking the time out. Ladies and gentlemen, another big round of applause for Mr. Sona Wangchuk. But we have about five minutes for quick questions. If anyone has any questions, you can address them right now. Sir so has about five minutes to answer any of the questions. We have one question, right? I'm coming to you, sir. Go, go. All right. We'll go to Daisy first. Yeah. Mr. Wang, thank you very much for making such a big contribution already and opening our eyes to the reality of the world around us. But what gave you the courage when you started? Huh. Um, he asked me what was the inspiration, what was the courage, I feel uh, 
necessity is the mother of invention, as you say, yeah? So when I saw my younger brothers and sisters were going through all such problems as, you know, failure year after year, I call it like your house is on fire. When your house is on fire, educationally speaking, you don't need inspiration and you get the courage from the scene. So that's what started me. And then once you start, the effects of the last action and the impact move you further. So I say that's what keeps me. Yeah. Thanks so much. Any more questions? Just put your hand up and we get a mic right there. Hello. Yeah. So, Andrew, it was, this was inspirational, I, I must say. So, thank you for coming here. Uh, my question, I think you've been on this journey of using science to transform, and basic science to transform a lot of things. Uh, <clears throat> but you know the education system in the rest of the country. Uh, everybody talks about it is broken. Uh, how are you looking at changing the education system in the rest of the country? How can we help? Yeah. Uh, in doing that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. There are two important wings of the bird. Um, one of which is to help people doing it, to train teachers, to help the system and so on. And for that, we are hoping to have modules in this alternative university so that people, passionate people in other places who want to replicate rather than us going there to do it, can come, you know, learn from our mistakes and successes, and then we can help from distance once they have done a module and understood the thing. That's only one part. The more important part is that things don't change till people change their mindsets. Yeah? If we still continue the same mindset in general population that uh, you have to score marks only and you have to aim for engineering alone or administrative service, then the system won't change because system reflects the people. So therefore, there's as much need to change the programming and priorities and thinking of the people. Now that will need a bigger uh, scale of work. In fact, if you saw KBC, uh, a year or two ago where I appeared. The only reason I had appeared was because it could change people's thinking about education system. I don't care about such programs. I had said no the first time they approached. Then I thought in Ladakh we had to go through such hardships to get to these villages and here was one medium that goes into every home of some several crores of people. So media needs to get involved personalities, spiritual leaders, all, all that you can use in life. So that thinking needs to change as much. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for one more question. Right now. So Anshu, I saw the movie 3 Idiot. It was a fantastic movie, but the past half an hour was even better than this. Uh, my question might sound funny, but I'm actually seriously asking this. Did you actually think the nose comes in between when you kiss someone? Sorry. Did you actually think that the nose will come in between when you kiss someone? <laughs> no, I so don't that know. was just made up. <laughs> yeah, made up. I <laughs> don't know. I'll, I'll go and check. <laughs> okay. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Tavak. Thank you so much. <laughs> On that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. One more time, I'd like to say that all the pictures, all the visuals, all the statistics that we saw truly stand testament to all the hard work this gentleman has put in to make the educational reforms of this country so much better. And from the bottom of our hearts, sir, on behalf of everyone, Cisco Connect 2019, thank you for taking the time up and sharing your story with us. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause for Mr. Sun Wang Chuk. And now the time has come to say goodbye to all our online audience who's watching this on the live broadcast. We've had 65,000 people tune in today. So can we give all of them a big round of applause as they've been part of Cisco Connect 2019 as well. Thank you very much. Good night and see you very, very soon.